if you look at some of the principles that innovators follow in those extreme conditions where they face significant constraints, um, often what works in these places is simpler, it's less complex, it's more focused in what it's attempting to achieve, and there is a danger with innovation that innovation simply leads to a sort of baroque proliferation of over-engineered features, which we then call innovation, but actually it's ineffective. So one of the first things that frugal innovators do, I think, is that they focus on simple and effective. Um, the second thing that they do is they don't just do more with less. The fact that they have less becomes an advantage rather than a disadvantage because, because they lack buildings or teachers or equipment or computers, they have to do what innovators always do, which is to see things in a new way to open up new possibilities. And so the, the strength of really frugal innovators is that they turn constraints to their advantage uh, and they use the constraints to open up radical possibilities. For us at Bridge, we think about frugal innovation in three ways. When you're limited to only $5 a month per child, $60 a year, you don't have the luxury to base your work on ideology, to base your work on assumptions. You can only look at what data can drive you to prove how you can better educate that child. You have to have the courage to break down those petrified ideologies, which often have now become our education standards and policies and laws. What most innovators in a frugal environment are doing is technically illegal, right? It's technically against what their national or state government says. But driven by what is best for the child, they don't let that limit them. And they're willing to experiment and then get the data to change the policy later on. You have to design from scale from the beginning. If you truly only have 100 children paying $60 a year, there's very limited things you could do to radically change what happens inside that classroom. So at Bridge, we started with the premise to really change what happens in these incredibly frugal, incredibly limited environments. Imagine it differently. Don't think about one school with 100 children or one school with 1,000 children. Think about 1,000 schools with 1,000 children. When you're working at a number of serving a million families, then $60 a year isn't so small. And then you can really start to rethink how to invest in education for those living below the poverty line. From our perspective, frugal is not necessarily always good. Frugal means something that is cost effective. Not only is it low cost, but it is also very, very effective, which then obviously raises the question, how do you measure effectiveness? Oftentimes, there is this desire to do something new and to do something different because that is what innovative means to a lot of people. But in fact, there is so much learning that is happening around the world, that has happened around the world uh, in the last 50, 60 years as we are trying to uh, uh, get to better learning outcomes in education. Combined with that, there is, uh, uh, we've, we've become much better at measuring outcomes. So what are we doing to take this learning from one part of the world and scale it up in another? And if somebody, all that somebody does is take a very simple intervention, let's say designed by Bridge in Kenya, and takes it to Ghana and tries to just duplicate that model, is it still called innovation or is it called cheating or is it called just duplicating? And, and, and I think uh, that is a very important point that in this desire to do something new, uh, we don't build on the knowledge that we have. When we, we think about successful models, and we've, we've studied models from Brazil through to Africa through to Asia, there's three characteristics that they display, and, and some that have already been alluded to. One is that they are high quality, they are sustainable, and they are scalable. The other things that is critical in any kind of innovation, and something that Shannon spoke about, is being systematic and have very clear systems and processes to ensure that consistency of delivery. The low-cost private schools have opened the door to a lot many innovative, interesting ideas, but there's also a lot more research that needs to be done about the cost aspects as well as the effectiveness aspects. How can you possibly expect students to become innovators 
whereas uh, the teachers themselves aren't allowed to innovate in their classrooms and they're given scripted models. Being a scripted instruction program isn't about getting rid of the teacher. It's about maximizing a teacher's ability to succeed in the classroom because they no longer have to worry about understanding the science of teaching phonemes to a six-year-old. That's done for them by someone else. And they can worry just about how to be the most magnificent teacher, most inspiring teacher that that child has ever seen. The problem here is just you know, teacher attendance. It's teacher delivery. It's, it's around just getting the basics of the education delivered. And I think where we have seen some very successful models, including Bridge, is where they have worked hard on making it systematic. And I know scripted has a very negative connotation, but it allows for a very efficient delivery of, of the basics of education, so that the, the reading, writing, and arithmetic. One of the big challenges in um, frugal innovation is actually, of course, evaluation. And it's never frugal. You can build in data systems, but of course you need independent evaluation. And, and I myself have been grappling with this, um, and we have good evaluations, we think, internally, but there's always a need for an external evaluation. And whenever I talk to people, it's, uh, the answer is usually, well, you should really get the Poverty Action Lab to get your evaluation done, right? Okay, how much does it cost? And then I'm a little blown away with the number. Okay, it's not frugal. So somewhere we need to go from one extreme of evaluation to perhaps only, perhaps not so randomized evaluations. There has to be somewhere a middle path that we can all take. If you are an organization which, which, is, you know, which is wedded to a particular idea, you feel that that's what the idea is and come what the results of the evaluation may be, you are not going to change that idea, then I don't think you want to invest the money in an impact evaluation. Uh, similarly, if you're not going to learn from the system, then you should not do an impact evaluation. But if you are somebody who's sitting here and saying, I have a very nice idea, and I think it is going to work, just, I, I just want to encourage you to think five years ahead of, and say, when you come and go and pitch that idea to a MacArthur or to a Gates Foundation, or you go and talk to six other governments, will they share your enthusiasm for that idea? Will they be able to see from your lens that this idea was so successful? Or will their first question be skepticism? You know, because for every one idea that you have, they are listening to seven other ideas. Policymakers are listening to seven other ideas from seven other people. How are they going to pick winners from one versus the other? And if you don't have impact evaluations, if you're not measuring your outcomes, we are back to square one of this policymaker being given nine ideas and picking up this one or that one based on instincts and ideology. Please, listen to Iqbal. You need to test it. None of us come up with something that's right just in our heads because it's what we like. That's just our own prejudice. We have to work together, test it, and then it's worth seeing if you can push something to scale, and then maybe you can change the lives of not 100 children, but a million of them. What's the role that you see for technology in creating frugal systems? Sagata Mitra's hole in the wall would be a frugal system, a MOOC is a frugal system in some ways. Uh, are there, do you think, really effective models of that emerging, or is it still technology leading and learning lagging behind? Yeah, and I think I mean, we, we're doing a lot of work in this space, and I think the headline from what we're discovering, not only in the sort of low-cost school space, but generally in the world of K-12, where, where technology can play a really big part in improving outcomes is if you put the technology in the hands of the teachers to help them with professional development. So I think there is a view in some parts of the world that if you give an iPad to every child, you can help him, we can provide him with the content at home, he, will, he, he or she will do better as a result. Uh, the research that we've done indicates that that is not the case. The, the way that you can actually influence outcomes is through professional development, using technology for professional development with teachers, which will then deliver better outcomes to, to the students. And I'm wondering if private schools are the only places we can have frugal innovation and given government budget constraints, can't those happen in public schools and that would be far more scalable than just the private school system? One of the, the lessons that we see is actually the private systems are actually quite open in terms of what they want to share. And we see the public uh, system actually 
benefiting and, and harnessing on that. So, for example, right now, we're working with a very small, small school called Rishi Valley that has developed a pedagogical system that allows you to teach kids at different age groups in one classroom. And the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation has taken that pedagogy and is working with government institutions to take that pedagogy to build more effective schools. Similarly, when you look at markets like uh, Bangladesh, GSS, which is a, another low-cost rural school provider, has worked with government to uh, expand its footprint. So it's using the government schools to get their whole system of teaching and learning in there. So again, I think innovation does come a lot from the private sector, but it's increasingly being harnessed by the public sector. Sometimes it's hard for public sectors to innovate as quickly as private providers. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be happening in both. Look at what you do differently. I'd be happy for them to adopt it. And I think that's more of the, the type of collaboration that I think we need both systems to be thinking about. You know, that, and really that they're not two different systems. It's all about solving the problem of our, our children learning. And if they're not learning, we better do something about it now, not worry about who the provider is, do worry about if they can afford it, whether that's by property taxes or by out-of-pocket fees, and how we can make that truly free or at least truly affordable for everyone.